Well, Jack, welcome back. The last interview we did was a big success. It, it, just people were talking about it all over the internet, it seemed like. Uh, so thank you. No problem. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you as well. Uh, well, your, your, the previous interview, you discussed groups and tuning and, and reading the groups and reading the pattern of the groups and reading everything about it. Uh, have you gotten any comments since that video that we did? Yeah, my email and phone lit up like immediately after <laughs> you posted it. So, um, but it's all good stuff. I mean, there's just such uh, such a need for information. People are really trying to get to the next level, uh, wherever they might be. And uh, you know, as their skill increases, you know, their their success will you know in tune. Uh, and tie into that and increase as well. So it's all good. It's a lot of, you know, small steps we all go through. Uh, I'm going to start my 25th year in bench rest. And a few years ago, I thought, you know, what else could I possibly learn? I've been doing this so long. And at the end of the year, I, I try to, you know, put together a document or add on to it. What did I learn this year? And when I look back, it's usually from mistakes and things where I screwed up that, um, you know, I'll, I'll have my greatest, you know, lessons from. So it, uh, I continue to learn and try to learn, you know, all the different things that, uh, you know, I think puzzle everybody at the end of the day or the, you know, the drive home from the match is always very uh, telling and, and stuff. So it's uh, very therapeutic. <laughs> yeah, that drive home. Uh, I, uh, so many times I've, you know, you drive home and you go, if if it wasn't for that, whatever. Oh, yeah. If it wasn't for that. If I could have that, had those 18 shots back, I would have won. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Jack, uh, tell us what, because, uh, uh, I mean, we know you're a Hall of Fame venture shooter, but you're a lot more than that. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Because we didn't, we didn't talk about you last time, and I think people need to know who you are. Well, I'm... Uh, uh, the sales and marketing manager for the Capstone Precision Group. Um, so uh, I get to sell all these great products. I work with a great team of professionals and, uh, you know, it really is a dream job. Uh, I also use my spare time, uh, the current president of the National Bentress Shooters Association. So uh, both those things uh, keep me going. Yeah. So you're the president of the, uh, the national, is it national? Ventress yeah, National Ventress Shooters Association. Uh, how can people get involved? People want to shoot a Ventress match. I mean, because that's kind of your way to the Hall of Fame, right? If you're not a member of the of the association, you can't you don't you can't earn points. How does that work? Well, we have two Ventress uh, different organizations. One is the uh, our our sister organization, which is the IBS International Ventress association uh shooters association then of course uh the national bench rest shooters association and you're able to earn hall of fame points um at the national specifically with either organization uh either through winning an aggregate uh or a grand aggregate or the respective uh three gun and uh it's the u.s bench rest hall of fame is an independent uh, hall of fame that was started by Skip Gordon years ago. Uh, it's currently overseen by the uh, capable stewardship of Rex Renault, uh, who uh, heads it up. And uh, it takes 10 Hall of Fame points to gain entrance in it or become a member of it. And, um, you know, it's obviously it's very challenging to win one Hall of Fame point, let alone uh, 10 points. And uh, it can take a long time uh, today with competition being, you know, as competitive as ever uh, to gain entry in it. But there is a path forward. Um, I can remember specifically in 1998, where usually the Hall of Fame inductees are done at the Super Shoot every year. And sitting there during the Hall of Fame presentation, um, and I think, gosh, 1998, I think maybe Jim Borden, uh, Faye Boyer, Fred Hazekuster, uh, I think those were the three inductees at that time. And when I inquired, what's this Hall of Fame thing about? How do you get in? And a friend of mine told me, well, you need 10 points. I'm like, okay, how do you get a point? Well, you've got to beat everybody at the nationals. 
in an aggregate. And I'm like, okay. And what happens if you get second or third place? So, oh, nothing. You don't get a damn thing. And I'm like, oh, I'll never get in that. That's just, you know, that's just way too far out of my reach. But, you know, through a lot of hard work and stuff, perseverance, it was one of my goals as things started to progress that I was fortunate to uh, be inducted in 2010. And one of the things that I really want to do is to help other people get in the Hall of Fame. You know, it, uh, we have to share the knowledge. Uh, you know, if we don't share the knowledge and help each other, uh, fundamentally uh, in our bench rest sport, we're going to go to a nationals and instead of having, you know, 100 people, we're going to have 30 people. And what good is it to win an aggregate or three gun when, you know, the attendance is so low? Uh, I'd rather have a lot more people find success, which is enjoyment, and it make them come back. And uh, that's what we all need to stack hands. Everybody needs an ambassador, uh, whatever your shooting discipline is. You know, we're all brothers and sisters here, whether it's short range, bent rest, F class, long range, PRS, NRL. Um, you know, we, we need to get more people out shooting. And in my role, um, you know, I certainly want to gain uh, more members in our uh, National Bench Rest Shooters Association organization, and, and certainly uh, more people to try and enjoy out in our great sport. Right. Thank you. Um, and uh, I mean, you're doing a great job. <laughs> you, sh you are. Uh, do they have to be members of any of the associations to gain points, or just anybody can just show up and, and get a point as long as you win? No, you would need to be a member um, okay. in order to, you know, obviously uh, participate uh, in the MBRSA. If you've never shot in one of our registered matches, uh, we will allow someone to attend a match without having to join the organization. But um, on the second time you come back, we would ask uh, you join the organization. And it's, it's only $60 a year, and you get a really nice uh, monthly magazine with that. Okay. All right. All right. So brass prep, <laughs> that's where we left off last time. And uh, people have been beating my door down, wanting me to talk to you again <laughs> about brass All prep. Right. Cause that is, that's a big topic. And that is before we get into brass prep, I'm sure you've read secrets of the Houston warehouse. Oh yes. Yep. Yes. What did he do? to make his, what is it, a, what was it, a 22 PPC arc? Yeah, I, I think uh, TJ Jackson um, and the other gentleman, uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember all the uh, all the shooters or characters back then, yeah. but I know they uh, were using a snap neck where uh, the case barely, with a, a loaded round, would barely fit into the chamber uh -huh. and uh, the bullet would basically snap into place in the middle of the neck. Um, and it was not a size neck. It just relied on the normal neck tension from the brass uh, in order to hold the bullet in place, basically having the rifling seat the bullet in the case. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of different ways, Eric, of kind of getting uh, the rifles to shoot. Uh, there's probably more common denominators that work and it's just like golf i mean you could your golf swing can be anything but that six inches before it reaches that ball that club face has got to be on plane it's got to be square to your target i mean there there's certain things that have to be met and kind of the same thing follows in bench rest um you can try to swim upstream and blaze your own trail but sooner or later you're going to kind of have a frustrating path that uh, that's been tried and true for, you know, a number of years to, with no success. Um, and I do get calls literally every week uh, about brass prep, neck tension, neck clearance for neck turning. And neck turning and neck clearance is what I think is probably the number one thing that prevents people's bench rest rifles uh, from really reaching their maximum capability from agging uh, where you're putting together a bunch of so, uh, small small groups together. And uh, too many times people are really trying to 
make tolerances way too tight and don't realize that, you know, you do have to have some uh, uh, clearance, certainly, for that bullet to exit consistently out of that case. And when that case neck is turned really to where you've got a thousandths of clearance, maybe less than a thousandths, maybe one and a half thousandths, um, you're going to have a problem. And the other problem that I learned and I was taught by a machinist that unless you're using a ball mic every day as a machinist and you really have a skill set of accurately reading a ball mic, most people are making their case necks probably three, four, ten thousandths thicker than they realize. They're turning that um, two micrometer to a number they wish the brass was, but in actuality, uh, the cases that they're turning are, are much thicker. And I can cite just numerous examples over the years of people calling and saying, hey, can you help me? My gun's not shooting. I've tried literally several barrels and we work backward to, well, what are you turning your case next to? And inevitably, when they go and they try making brass a little thinner, even though they didn't want to try it, but I persuaded them, you've got nothing to lose. I've had numerous people call back and say, wow, the gun woke up. It, it's now shooting. You know, it, it's a big improvement. So little things mean a lot. And we are at the tip of the spear for rifle accuracy. So we do see a lot of things that other shooting disciplines, quite frankly, just don't see. And, um, you know, that's kind of uh, what our sport has been about, has been the, the pursuit of the ultimate inaccuracy um, in the, the rifle shooting. So you got to have enough clearance. Uh, that's uh, something I figured out by mistake. <laughs> I turned yeah, my, all my necks too thin, and then uh, I said, well, before I throw away all this brass, I might as well go shoot it. I mean, I got nothing to lose. And all of a sudden, my flyers went away. Everything became more consistent. And I thought, well, I guess I just found out something that works by mistake. And mm -hmm. that's what I've been doing ever since. Uh, obviously, I'm assuming the uh, a long range uh, rifle, you know, with the big heavy bullets, bolt tails and really long stuff. Uh, I'm thinking they might need more clearance than your PPC in order to perform the same. How much clearance do you usually uh, leave on your PPC total clearance? Um, for our sport, what I like to have is really closer to 3,000 total clearance, net clearance of that bullet. I would rather err on the side of more clearance than less clearance any day of the week. And there'll be a lot of people that will show me where they have a solid black carbon ring around the middle of the case neck. And that is like the kiss of death because that neck is just so thick is that where that's where the carbon is stopping. The uh, that neck is not fully expanding to release that bullet consistently. And that gun just is not going to shoot. That rifle's just not going to shoot with case necks that thick. And, um, you know, again, just a little bit more clearance when you neck turn uh, makes a huge difference huge difference what up and of course we're talking about the neck clearance right mm -hmm. uh, what are the uh, what are the signs of an improperly sealing neck because you just mentioned the, the the you know the carbon at the half of the neck halfway point what what should people be looking for to to be able to kind of give them a, a, an example of what's causing a problem? Yeah, it, it's, it's really easy. What we're looking for is a carbon sine wave up and down as you turn the case neck around. I'm sorry, I don't have my brass here. Um, but just a carbon sine wave where you're seeing based upon the locking lug design of your rifle, whether it's two lug or say a three lug, um, you'll see two or three different carbon sine waves. That's a good thing. That's showing that bullet, that case, uh, the case neck is opening up, releasing that bullet without restriction. Again, when you have that solid carbon line around the middle of that neck, uh, that is really, you know, bad stuff. And your rifle will shoot all over the place. I mean, it's it's not even close. What that's indicating is is brass, or not brass, but the gas has got to that point before it expanded, right? So that means 
where the it, that that's it kind broke. of pushing it in, right? So yes, it's it, not releasing the bullet properly. Right. So, now, conversely, you could have, and I'd rather take a uh, shoot brass that's too thin than too thick any day of the week. But uh, if, if you're getting a lot of blow by where that case neck is not really sealing, you'd really have to be shooting a thin neck that's not sealing uh, in that chamber where it's allowing some gas to come back uh, over the neck towards the shoulder. Um, and that's that's that when you get really that's when, in rare cases. That's when you get those dents, right? Past the shoulder. Well, the, the dents are caused either from a bronze br bristle coming off or a lot of times if you're a little bit too loose uh, using too much case lube, um, it's hydraulic and it will leave a dent on the side of your shoulder um, or possibly on the case neck itself. I'm talking about when you fire it, and then the, mm -hmm. I've seen I've seen where they get a dent below the shoulder. Um, have you seen that? Um, usually, that's it's not to do with anything other than some impurity or maybe powder kernel. Something in the chamber is denting that brass. Um, usually, like I say, it's uh, something that did not get cleaned out. Bronze bristle. Uh, it could be just a little bit of case lube. There's something there that that brass has got to form around, and it really is just from you know something that was left in the chamber from the last cleaning. It really doesn't have anything to do with blowback or anything else. All right. So brass prep. Where do you start? Just give us the whole okay. rundown. <laughs> um, real simple. You know, when I first started, I would buy all kinds of Lapua 220 Russian cases, like a lot of people, and I would put out uh, a piece of masking tape on my reloading bench with the scale, and I would sit there and weigh cases and segregate them by weight, thinking that, you know, this is the holy grail, mm -hmm. and cases within a tenth, two tenths, are going to shoot better than, you know, uh, cases that might be uh, two grains, you know, difference in weight, uh, uh, just a minuscule difference. And after a lot of testing, uh, I've had friends that have tunnels, um, really could not see any improvement where you could validate that weighing that case uh, made a difference. And I'll tell you why. This is where people go wrong. Um, I have friends and a lot of friends may do this as weigh their brass. But the problem is you don't know where that weight is with that respective case to case variance. That weight could be in the case head somewhere in the body. So you start segregating brass, but you don't know where that variance in weight might be. Um, now, obviously we make very good brass at Lapua, but um, you really aren't sure when you start trying to segregate cases by brass, what you're going to improve when you start um, you know, shooting them and things. Um, there's more wind condition out there than any benefit you will see from weighing your cases. Uh, and that's really the bottom line. If people put more time into practice out in the wind, not when it's calm in the morning, you know, they're gonna learn a lot more and gain a lot more than really sitting in the basement, re, uh, weighing their different uh, brass to make sure it's all within a 10th or two tenths. It's just not going to improve their shooting. All right, so don't weigh brass. No. <laughs> I quit doing that too. Um, what else? So 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 you don't weigh brass. You don't weigh toward brass anymore. Okay. Nope. So you take you take a piece of brass out of the box, or a, uh, mm -hmm. you open a box of Lapua 220 mm -hmm. Russian. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you do to that brass? Okay. Um, since I've got like an established headspace, which for our 220 Russian cases is the distance really from the case rim uh, to the shoulder, and with that. Uh, my gunsmith, Wayne Campbell, does all my work. He's maintaining a headspace to where literally I can put my barrels on any one of my different rifles without any problem of having to have segregated brass for that specific action. The actions are made that close within, within tolerance. Um, so, and the actions are all very good today, regardless of brand, as far as headspace between different actions. Once I uh, will take a case out of the uh, box, I will take my fire control out of the bolt. I'll put my fire control in a gun, in my rifle, and I will bump that shoulder back slowly uh, in my full length die 
until I can get that handle to close only about halfway. When I fire form, I want to make sure that there is no positive headspace. That means that that case is held tightly inside that chamber where when I'm closing that bolt, I'm making sure that that case really can't move. All right. So once I identify that shoulder bump back on that case, I will use my neck turners uh, to where I will set my cutter to where it lightly touches the shoulder. It doesn't go up the shoulder. It just lightly kisses the shoulder. And, you know, we can get into that maybe in a future video with some examples. Um, and what I'll do is once I bump that shoulder back, I will bump back all my shoulders for say 30 pieces. I'll make up 30 to 50 pieces of brass for a given barrel, depending upon the match size. Um, once I bump the shoulder back, now what I'll do, and this is really important, when people are neck turning brass, once you bump the shoulder back, don't just start expanding the neck and then you're letting that brass sit there. What's going to happen, even if you start neck turning, the first cases you're doing, you've got a nice snug fit, not too tight, but definitely not loose. And this is, you know, in another video, but you do want, uh, you've got to use a carbide mandrel on your neck turner, or as that neck turner heats up, you're going to have large variances where your necks are going to get uh, much thinner on your brass when that uh, neck turner is heated up. But uh, once I'm neck turning that case, you're going to have a certain feel for it. If I'm uh, expanding the necks on all my cases, and I've got cases that have been sitting there for a few hours now before I've gotten to them, those latter cases that have been sitting there, that brass, that neck is expanding, coming back to what yeah, it was. Contracting, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's springing back to where now when I'm trying to neck turn, I can feel the difference of increased friction. And that is going to really induce a lot more heat from the friction. And it will change your thickness of your cut and cause more inconsistency than you really want. So only expand right before you neck turn that case. I do not expand until I'm ready to pick up that piece of brass and neck turn. Yeah. Um, I've, I've seen that, uh, myself, but for F class, so how many pieces of brass do you prep at a time? Um, I usually do 30 to 50, yeah. uh, depending upon, you know, what match I'm going to. So that's the difference, uh, in F class, right? Like when I prep, I prep a thousand, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's just, a we just have to learn to deal with a lot more variance just right and you're not going to see what we see uh as far as you know we're really our two gun or three gun four guns and our group nationals and larger matches are decided by one ten thousandths of an inch sometimes i mean it when you start stacking up the aggregates and grand aggregates the differences are really really small uh, with the competitive sport that we're in right now. So right. again, we really see some nuances that other shooting ju disciplines just don't quite see. So so you neck turn your breast, you expand it, and you neck turn it, mm -hmm. and then you expand the next one. Do you ever, do you trim your breast at all before you start? No, and that's another thing. I usually, I will wait till maybe three or four firings before I neck turn it. Now, depending upon your reamer, some reamers, uh, in the 6 PPC, 22 PPC, you may have a reamer that has a trim length of 1500. Well, you've got to make sure that before you try to put that brass in the gun before it's fire form, you're going to have to trim it because it's probably going to be at 1503, maybe a little bit longer um, coming out of being neck turned before they're fire form where they're a little bit longer. So it's all predicated on the trim length of the reamer that you're using. You said you wait about three firings before you turn it. Did you mean? Did you mean trim? I'm it? sorry. Before I trim it, not okay, turn. It. Okay. Yeah. So you turn beforehand because I assume yeah. your, your chamber is tight enough that you can't you can't chamber an unturned piece of breast, correct? No, you cannot. No, okay. I'm currently shooting a 268 uh, reamer, but mm -hmm. I've used 262 and 263. And uh, for an example, for my 268 neck, uh, I'll turn my brass to 11 thousandths. So with different bullets, whether it's a flat base that has a pressure ring uh, that might be, you know, 243.3 on the pressure ring, 
or Bowtail, that's just slightly over 243.3. I've got plenty of clearance. I know that if there's any issue, it is not because, you know, the brass is just too thick. That's just out of the equation. So at what point, you discussed about turning a brass too thin. At what point do you think it's too thin? Um, you know, I had a friend of mine that uh, he and his son uh, built rifles, uh, great guys. And, you know, at the time I was, you know, and still today, uh, for larger matches, I would use, you know, newer brass. And, you know, we would go back and forth about nothing shoots better than fresh brass. And that is true. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would shoot his cases, he and his son, for a long time. He had uh, turned 100 case necks for he and his son to use at a match. And as it turns out, he loaned his neck turner to a friend. And uh, he had a 262 neck. And he thought that he was cutting his brass to 8.5. Well, unbeknownst to him, his friend, when he borrowed the neck turner, he adjusted it to make a thinner cut without telling him. So when my friend got his neck turners back and made 100 cases, he and his son went to a range. We're up at Holton, Michigan for the Eastern Regionals, and both their rifles were shooting great. And he came over to me and says, now I know why you make new brass. Our rifles are shooting great. And later on, he came over to me on some cases that he had measured the thickness of the neck. He hadn't fired formed yet. He says, oh, my gosh, you'll never believe this. He said, I thought I was turning the brass to be about 8.3 or 8.5 in thickness. And this guy I loaned my neck turners to and adjusted it. The brass is actually less than eight thousandths. It's about six, seven, ten thousandths thinner than what he estimated. He said, now I got to tell you, when I saw the brass be this thin, if I would have known this, I would have thrown the brass away. <laughs> but you made me a believer on this, you know, turning uh, thin to win and, and providing a little bit more clearance. I said, yeah, there really is not a downside. I mean, there is diminishing return, certainly, where if you're making the brass super thin, uh, it's not going to seal. So, you know, I make it thin enough to where I don't have a problem and stop there. But uh, again, it's it's just so important to have that uh, clearance. I, ha I had somebody ask me on my website uh, about three days ago on my forum um, if uh, he wanted to open up his, his chamber neck mm -hmm. because he says he has to turn his necks down to about 12 and a half thousands and that's just way too thin i said that is <laughs> not too thin it's just go you know go for it he was really super worried about that i said right. you'll be fine that's that's actually quite thick compared to what you guys do right um so take the brass out of the box mm -hmm. you uh bump your shoulders Full length die, bumping the shoulder back. And, um, and then the, right before. Turn. Yeah. Oh, you right expand. Neck, neck, neck turn. Expand, neck turn. Neck turn. Right. And let me say this when I'm done expanding here. This is so important. And I'm sure you'll identify this. Anyone who's neck turning cases. Um, I will chamfer and deburr the, the mouth of the case. Uh -huh. And then they go in for a really nice. Uh, Ice bath. Yeah. Either acetone <laughs> or lacquer thinner bath. And it's so important to make sure you dry the case and use a Q-tip, not once, but twice, right before I actually am going to fire form and put primers and powder. The cases, just take a Q-tip again. It, I'll tell you, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I mean, we've all done it. You're going to fire form. You go up there and you're pulling the trigger click and you're hitting that primer over and over, hoping that it's going to go off. But what's happened is that you had residual oil that was left inside the case that uh, had uh, destroyed the primer. And, uh, you know, it, it's easily preventable, but you do need to go through the steps to make sure you give the cases a uh, proper bath and lacquer thinner acetone. And then uh, do a couple times at least once uh, with a Q-tip to make sure they're oil free. Do you keep your uh, neck turner in, in ice water or anything to keep just, I mean, you're doing 30 cases and you, you leave enough room or not room, but time in between, right? When you're expanding 
it just it just you're not heating it up yeah no i'm not doing you know certainly the quantity of cases that you're doing um you know but uh and i have tried the proverbial keeping the neck turner and uh in an ice bath and that just was like a bigger mess than what <laughs> that was and, yeah i tried um, that too and then uh, but I, I wasn't a fan you know the the real thing too and believe me I, i'm as anal as anybody for wanting the best possible necks and turning. I used to turn, I won't tell you how many passes I would make with a Nielsen neck turner to really try to make sure the cases were uh, very, very good. Um, but really the, the reality is this, when you fire form that first time, that brass is flowing up that neck. And very quickly, if you were to measure your case necks after a few firings, with a good neck checker, you would find that the top of the case mouth gets thicker, the middle of the neck, it gets a little thinner, and the base of the neck is thick. So that brass is not flowing uniformly. So, you know, we are all trying to start with the best possible cases turn to with less than a ten thousandths of an inch. But after a few firings, believe me, all those, you know, goals and aspirations of having perfect necks the the brass does change uh with uh you know the gas flow and the uh, brass flow from the gas so and ventress do you guys anneal at all ever you know there is a red roof in in uh, plymouth michigan that's probably banning me or doesn't want me to come <laughs> back uh, in the early 2000s when kind of annealing kind of came up i bought a ken uh light annealing machine and a friend of mine and I, I think it was room 112, I think I burnt the wallpaper in the <laughs> hotel room on a Friday night, or yeah, I think it was a Friday night before the match, where my two jet flames were doing a great job annealing the case, but it also annealed the wallpaper. But that's another story. But uh, I've tried it, uh, you know, and hey, I, I can't knock it. People are, are really, you know, uh, seen in the process of, uh, for me, I'm more worried about the primer pocket. Uh, that to me is, oh, you know, what I'm looking at. And I'll make new brass up. For smaller matches, I'll use my brass maybe four to five matches. Uh, new, new, or excuse me, large matches, I'll make up new cases. And really, for we look at what we spend to go to a regional match. Um, you know, for a weekend, the hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars we spend, and you're looking at a dollar, dollar 25 a piece of brass. It, it's really a small expense. They're consumable items. They really are. And the people that are really trying to stretch their case life, you know, it, in our game, particularly um, where you start losing neck tension and you can feel variance when you're seating bullets, you know, that that gun is just not going to shoot anywhere near as good as having fresh brass. Let's recap your brass prep. You uh, take the brass out, you bump your shoulders, mm -hmm. you uh, expand. I expand your right neck before turn, I neck turn. I neck turn, turn. you mm -hmm. chamfer, deburr, and then you, you pretty much get all the oils out of the brass. Mm -hmm. You know, however method they want to use, they just got to get right. all the oils off. Mm -hmm. Then you load the brass and then you go fire form it. How many times do you fire form it before you call that brass good to go? Uh, this is another great topic. You know, I have people that I shoot with or know that will fire form their brass three times before it goes in a match. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you know what? With my rail gun, I've proven to myself and other people that I've taken brass that was fire form one time and with it, it's about 90% formed, not totally formed with a good square uh, edge on the shoulder uh, mm -hmm. body junction. But I'll go out with the rail gun with once fired brass. And in practice, I've proven it to myself. It shoots excellent. It really does. It's that close. I would have no problem taking just a fire form case and putting it right into match, shooting it right away. Now, a lot of times I'm going to practice the day before the match. So the case will have maybe a couple firings, but I have taken brass that's been fire form and put it right into to cases. Um, and I, Eric, I want to take this moment. Just I know people sometimes will mark their brass with red for cider. 
uh, maybe black for their good brass, for their record target. And I'll ask, how do you differentiate or what made this case just only for the cider? Well, I lost a shot on that case. That case is bad. And normally that case gets thrown down range or marked just cider. I'm like, you know what? I would have no brass to shoot if every time I lost a shot, I would throw a case away. And, and really, it, there's other factors involved. So guys, gals, don't throw your brass away or mark it cider. If you've lost confidence in a piece of brass because of age or whatever, just get rid of it. But again, at some point, you got to look in the mirror when you're losing shots and say, you know what? I'm marking all this brass ciders, you know, it, 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 <laughs> the, there, uh, there's some other nuance there that's preventing your success. So when I started shooting, uh, uh, I started doing the weight sorting, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, I would go and shoot over the chronograph when I was fire farming. And I, mm -hmm. would, I would sort by chronograph numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that wasn't working. And the previous one wasn't working. So then I had this big epiphany, right? I'm like, ah, I know what I'm going to do. And mm -hmm. I'm going to fire form all my brass, and then I'm going to go to a match. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to sort the brass in any way possible. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to go, and I'm just going to shoot. I'm never going to, you know, I'm going to get my rifle centered up on waterline, and then I'm not going to click after that. And if it shoots X's, they go in the X pile. If it shoots an, at 10 low, it's going to go here. If it hits a 10 high, it's going to go here. And, of course, 9 lows, 9 high, they go here. And that's how I used to uh, separate my brass. And, uh, and guess what? I had all my X's. <laughs> and then those X's, somehow, they would also shoot high 9's and 10's. Mm -hmm. and things of that nature so then i separated some more <laughs> and it became where oh, uh yeah. i was like okay i'm done with this we've all method. been there yeah it's you know everybody goes through the same thing and, and you can never laugh at anyone because if you shoot whatever shooting sport discipline long enough you're going to make all the same mistakes and it it really is it's tread and riser as you start learning what makes sense and what doesn't and you can only measure run out to a 10th and all these perfect, uh, you know, measurements or practices. At some point, you have to get out there in the wind and you have to pull that trigger. And a lot of this time and prep and worry about different things is really meaningless when on your last shot, that condition reverses and all that work you did weighing that brass or babying that case goes out the window when you decided to pull the trigger in a complete opposite uh, condition or a major pickup. Yeah. Um, so but to talk to your point, uh, talking a little bit about uh, seating, or excuse me, primer uh, seating. Um, yeah. Again, uh, some years ago, uh, I was shooting well at 100 yards. I felt very competitive with anybody I shot with. And I had a friend of mine say, are you cleaning your pr primer pockets? I go, oh, yeah, every time. He goes, don't do that. That's a waste of time. I said, well, and I really, I'd like, you know, make sure the primer pocket's clean and I don't want to recut that and clean it. Nope. Makes no difference. I said, wow, if I can save a step here and reload quicker by not having to clean out the primer pocket with a non-adjustable uh, primer tool that's cleaning and recutting the flow of that brass, to where all my primer pockets are cut to the exact same depth, this is great. This just simplifies the process. It allows me to reload quicker at these smaller matches. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon, at 100 yards, I wasn't shooting as well as what I had been. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was at the East-West uh, match. Gosh, I won't tell you the year. But uh, I was had been struggling on Saturday morning at 100 yards. I thought, you know what? I want to get back to a solid reloading practice to what worked for me before. I wonder if not cleaning these primer pockets had made any difference. So I had some brass that I seated primers with, with the same you know pressure, which I just really crushed the primer. Uh, I'm not trying to measure the depth, but my goal is to have the primer, top of the primer be recessed below the case head. Uh -huh. And I started feeling these primers. Some were a little bit flush with the case, uh, top of the case um, rim, and some were recessed. 
And it was like that aha moment, Eric, where it's like, I wonder if this is hurting me. And I'd answered my own question. So before the next aggregate in the afternoon, the Heavy Varmint 100, I went through my brass and recut, cleaned all the primer pockets, reseeded uh, primers in it to where each primer was slightly below the case head. And right away, I could see an immediate improvement in my rifle and how well it shot. And, you know, there's just no shortcut sometimes in things that matter. Well, um, to, so, so let, me, let me give you some input on that from, from my experience. I tested that myself, and I got to the point where I just quit cleaning them. I'm, I guess I'm your buddy. <laughs> okay. I couldn't see. But again, you know, we have different needs, right? Different. Mm -hmm. um, and my brass gets shot maybe 10 times for the life of the barrel. And uh, I just test it and test it. And, but again, you know, I'm testing at 1,000 yards. And if I have a, a mm -hmm. four-inch gun at 1,000, I'm really happy. You know, five mm -hmm. shots, I'm really happy. Sure. And if one day I go out there and it shoots five inches, I'm like, uh, mm -hmm. that's still pretty good. I mean, that's a really okay. good gun at 1,000, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I just haven't really, based on my testing, hasn't showed up. However... I do have a rail gun that I'm about to put together. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to go into some, some more testing. I'm, I'm pretty much going to test all that stuff all over again with a rail gun to see, you know, how much it matters or if it matters in what I do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it's one of those things that to me makes no sense. Like how can it, how can it not change? But then I shot it on target and I'm like, no difference. So I'm, I'm just going to quit doing it. Kind of like you said, if I can save the right. time, I'm going to save it. Um, mm -hmm. And I just quit cleaning brass altogether. And it's, I haven't seen any difference, mm -hmm. but I will, that is one of those things that I will test with a rail gun to, you know, double make sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And little things do matter. I mean, again, in our sports different short range bench rest, where we see some things but the same physics applies. If that bullet doesn't start out right, you know, coming out of the barrel, whether you're shooting short range or long range, it's not magically gonna get back onto target. Um, the other thing that does make a difference for both of us, and I'm sure you'll agree, uh, is case trimming. Uh, again, yes. early on, um, a friend of mine, uh, we were sharing a reamer and the reamer had a of in 6 PPC, a 1510 trim length, 1.510. And as long as my friend and I were make sure that uh, we were trimming our cases um, and the case neck didn't grow enough to encroach near that trim length of that reamer, our rifle shot fine. But if we got lackadaisical and lazy where we weren't trimming our cases and the cases started growing, to 1506, 1508, 150, whatever, but start getting close to that neck, uh, that trim length, all of a sudden our rifles would immediately quit shooting. So we said, hey, you know what, let's get a new reamer. We'll buy a new reamer that's got a 1525 trim length and we'll never have to worry about, you know, having our rifle shoot bad because, you know, we got lazy or we forgot to trim the case necks the night before the match. So great. So uh, I can remember being at a range that I shoot locally here and we had an honest day at the range, nine o'clock left or right crosswind at 200 yards. And my rifles were shooting, I normally will practice it with four shot groups once I kind of have things working and just to see the uh, seating depth and the load. And my four shot groups were producing maybe big fours or fives at 200 yards and I'm like, you know, this rifle should be shooting much smaller. I'm going to do everything I can to this brass to give it the best possible chance to shoot. So I dusted off the uh, case trimmer and I started trimming my brass back for 6 PPC to 1490. I had a 1510 trim length and I wanted that case to be all uniform and well back from that. Immediately, the rifle came alive. It started to shoot dots. It got to a point where I was telling my friends, look, I think I'm onto something with this case trimming that I didn't think was gonna make a difference. And they would trim some cases and load 
Other cases they would load without trimming and I would give my best effort. And we had a great day where it's an honest left or right uh, condition where you could really see what the rifle was doing with the tune. And every time that it was brass that was not trim, it would be like a glob. And every time the cases that were trim, you could see a, a demonstrable difference. And again, it was one more lesson I needed to learn that keeping your cases trim does make a big difference for the uh, for ignition and for that rifles uh, for that tune. So I used to have a, a friend that we used to shoot go to matches together. He was my shooting partner, right? Mm -hmm. But we were always competing against each other. That's mm -hmm. and that's what keeps us going oftentimes, right? Right. You, you don't care if you if you don't you don't care if you come in. If you two are the last ones on, as long as you beat him, that's, that's you all. You beat that your buddy, yeah. Yeah. So that was us, right? Well, mm -hmm. uh, this is back in 2010 or so, 2011. This is when I'm trying to get into the game and I'm trying to do all the testing, right? That's that's mm -hmm. what I decided to do. I'm, I'm just going to test everything for myself. Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't trimming brass. And my, my whole thing was if it needs to be trimmed, it's gone, right? right. That mm -hmm. was my thing. Mm -hmm. Well, then I realized I was, I, was throwing a, I was throwing away a lot of good brass. And mm -hmm. then uh, I decided I'm going to trim brass. Mm -hmm. But because I have a thousand yard range, I, I figured, well, why waste the opportunity to do a test? Mm -hmm. So I took five rounds untrimmed brass and I trimmed five bra uh, pieces of brass with a Jarrell trimmer mm -hmm. that I borrowed from a friend because I didn't want to spend the money. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, He'd go out to a thousand yards, and I sh I shot my first five. I we had a walkie-talkie. I said, "Okay, clear." He'd walk out and pace the shots, and he'd get back and, uh, behind cover again. And then I shot the next five, and he called me back. He goes, "I don't know what you did on the last five, but holy smokes, that is a tiny group. You know that you cut that group like by two thirds. It was it was like a uh, the first group was like eight inches, and the other one was like three and a half or something like that. Wow. And uh, so of course he's like, "What did you do? What did you?" I said, "I don't know. I, I just, I guess the wind was died down on the last, but I knew what I did. So the last group, the small group, was trimmed. So yep. from there on, I trim every time, every time. Yep. The drill trimmer, the chamfers trims everything, so it gets used every time. Right. Yeah. Again, little things stack up, and little things do matter, regardless at a hundred yards or a thousand yards, you know, it, uh, you know, certainly there's overkill where, you know, you're weighing the cases to a point and things. Um, but some of the basics where the primer seating depth was consistent below the case head, trimming the brass, uh, bumping the shoulder. Uh, in our game, I like to feel some resistance in closing that bolt handle. I don't want it overly tight, but I do not want that bolt falling down to where there is a little bit of positive head space where that case is literally fire forming every time. Now I know for you guys, I think you probably are wanting to bump that shoulder back, you know, what, two to four thousandths mm -hmm. possibly. We bumped to two thousandths. Okay. All right. That's, yeah. That's I like easy. to bump to about a thousandths, you know, and, and again, and, kind of gets into a, a different subject of getting the proper full length die to make sure it's, you know, sizing properly based upon the reamer that you're using for your chamber. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, obviously, like I said, we, 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 we operate under totally different conditions, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. There's, there's dust flying at Maybe, you all the right. time. So if you try to do 1000th and you do, yeah. Yeah. 500 pieces of brass that mm -hmm. just you know there's going to be variance and if you try to keep sure. it at 1000 there's going to be some brass can be really tight right and some that's not and that that just becomes problematic especially when you're trying to you know you know you can upset the gun and then there's debris flying in there and it's just uh right. it, it, it becomes a, a part of it is obviously uh shoots very accurate at 2000 um, mm -hmm. but if you do any less than that, then it becomes unreliable. And yeah, and I do want to point out, I think Eric, you would agree when you are setting up your full length die, take your time. You know, once you bump that shoulder back, if you've gone too far, the only thing now you can really do is try to fire form it to bring it back. 
Um, when I am setting up my full length die, I like to use a selection of brass that might have been shot with a little bit lighter loads as well as hotter loads, because I really like to see where I'm setting up that bump back to where it's a consistent bump back. It's not set for bump back for maybe some of the brass that I've been using testing lighter loads versus hotter loads, because the hotter loads, certainly that brass has grown more right. and will require more shoulder bump back. So it's really important not to use one case. Okay, now I'm going to set up my full length die. I really want to see, you know, maybe uh, several cases at least to where I'm getting a, a proper uh, selection or sampling, if you will, uh, of how much that shoulder needs to be bumped back. Yeah, also older brass uh, requires more bump because uh, yeah. it springs back more, especially if you're not a needling. It, it just becomes a, a moving target on you. Just like anything else, right? Like when I told people to quit neck sizing, oh, just. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I get the same thing in arguments over why not neck size. I'm like, well, it just doesn't work. It, it's great for if you're shooting real light loads, but after a while that work brass gets work hardened and you've got to bump the shoulder back or you will gall your lugs, you know? It's, yeah, so, so um, is there, what about ignition? Like, what do you guys worry about when it comes to ignition, you know, to hitting that primer? What is it that you guys, you know, what is the checklist? What does a checklist look like for you guys? Because I know there's got to be a checklist. <laughs> well, I tell you, and just like in rimfire shooting, ignition is key. It is so important. And it will take a rifle uh, that might shoot quarter inch groups and bench rest down to a rifle that could shoot maybe 180s or, or sub two tenths just by something that might be slightly dragging. And you can bet like the top gunsmiths and the top shooters in our game. And I've been fortunate enough to learn so much from so many people over the years that uh, have taught me so much about ignition. And, you know, you may think everything is good, but it could be better. Um, you know, I, I've had a, a friend of mine uh, who had passed away but he was a master machinist. He lived in Oroville and um, spent a lot of time in his shop in his basement where he showed me where like a, uh, with a Panda rifle and this you can do with a lot of actions where he would take apart the fire control and literally put everything back together without the sp uh, spring. And he would hold the bolt vertically and the fire control and he would press slightly on the shroud while releasing the firing pin. And he was looking for a certain amount of play. And he would take me through this education, I'll never forget. He said, you know, shake this and the fire control or the firing pin should move real freely. And I said, okay. And he said, all right, now put your thumb on the side of the shroud, replicating some of the bind that when you're cocking that rifle over that top sear of maybe the jewel trigger or Bix Nandy, whatever you're using, and see if it's as free. So I put my thumb on the side of the shroud and it wasn't moving. And he took it apart, put Dykem on the cocking piece and polished it until after his polishing, I could put my thumb on the side of the shroud and that firing pin would still move up and down. And it was like a major aha moment of learning that what you think might be fine, but when someone really shows you some advantage or some things that make it, you know, a little bit better, it really leads to a better shooting rifle. And regardless of brand of action, there are things that need to be done to look for and try to make sure the ignition is everything that it can be. The, uh, when I decided to do my own gunsmithing work, I uh, I contacted Speedy and I said, "Hey, I need I need to learn this stuff. I need you to teach me." If, you know, he's mm -hmm. like, "Come on, boss, I'll, I'll teach you." Right. So we did a one on one. Long story short, I brought my F class rifles, and back then I was I was using custom actions, but I was not using uh, Jim Borden actions. So. Whatever, Speedy goes through, after we did a couple of days, he's like, well, let me take a look at your rifles. And the first thing he did is grab that bolt 
and he grabbed the shroud and he just he was able to move it back and forth and he says well this ain't no good grabs the other one well this ain't no good and uh, i said well wait a minute but they're custom actions and he's like it doesn't matter boss <laughs> so oh yeah. yeah he 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 showed me how to fix all that and my goodness those rifles shot i thought they shot well oh they shot way better right. and uh the joke that i always told him was uh I said, God dang it, boss. I said, they were fine until I got here. They were perfectly good rifles until you yeah. got a hold of them. But he just, he went to that ignition immediately and he showed me how to blueprint a bolt. And right. oh my God, what a what a difference that made. And I to this day, even though I trust Jim Borden 100%, mm -hmm. I still, every time I get an action, doesn't matter. Uh, I go through it and just to verify. Because another thing I learned from Speedy was... Everything is broken until I check it. So, yeah, yeah and it, it again, it it's well money well spent to have a good bench rest or a great gunsmith go through your ignition, whether it's rim fire, whatever center fire, whatever the uh, action is. That ignition is is so very very important. So, okay, so we're on the topic of ignition. Uh, how heavy of a spring do you guys use? Do you, have you found, have you guys tested different spring uh, uh, weights? Yeah, it, it varies depending upon action. Um, you know, depending upon the manufacturer, you know, the heavier springs, I would say, are best. But there's a point of no return where if it's too much, now you've taken out the algorithm of your proper ignition to where it's now causing vibration at ignition to where the gun's not going to shoot uh, to its potential. So do you guys, uh, you know, let's just say, let's say I give you an action right now. It is an unknown action. You've never shot it. You, you know, you don't have any experience or nobody that you know has experience. It's, a, it's all brand new to you. Knowing what you do now, would you test different spring weights? Where would you start? to make sure that this thing can shoot as good as possible? Uh, right now, you know, when I, I get a new action, I'll send it, uh, Wayne Campbell doing all my work, and I'll have him go through the fire control. That's like paramount and look for a number of things. Um, but the spring weight is important. You can take several springs to the range, change them up on the bench and see a difference. Jack lost his internet. So we're not going to be able to get them back. We're going to have to get them back a third time because this, uh, it was just getting really interesting. We're just diving into the, uh, you know, the whole ignition thing, which is super important. But anyway, I'm sorry that this happened, but we'll have them back again. All right. Anyway, uh, happy new year, Merry Christmas. And, uh, thanks for joining us. Keep them centered. And I I'm feeling